Good afternoon and welcome uh, to our presentation of the economics of climate change policy. My name is Peter Gelato and my partner's name is Andrew Tan. Um, today we're going to be discussing uh, the state of cl current climate science research and the projections for the further economic cost of uh, climate change. Um, we're also going to be discussing some of policy options and programs um, and their expected economic impact uh, and the challenges we foresee uh, for climate change policy in the future. Um, the Stern Review um, projects global economic losses from climate change to be on around 5 to 20 percent um, of global GDP, um, which is a huge amount and is something that the world needs to really seriously consider. In President Obama's State of the Union address um, a few days ago, he mentioned that climate change is a fact and that America needs to stand up and take the lead in the world towards uh, further climate change um, policies to help um, combat further global warming. Um, my partner and I, Andrew, are going to put forth uh, some proposals that we think can uh, help can combat further global warming, um, and we think that they are proposals that should be implemented in the United States. While we're looking at existing climate science research, we look at the IPCC reports, the AR4 and the preliminary AR5 report, uh, which uh, both have found that global temperatures are increasing at a statistically significant rate and this is expected to accelerate in the next 100 years unless something changes. Uh, and some of the impacts of climate change are already very evident. For example, in, uh, based on the AR4, 11 of the past 12 years ranked among the hottest 12 years ever recorded. Arctic sea ice is also declining and sea levels are rising. Other studies also show a statistically significant um, temperature changes, and these include the MIT study and various other peer-reviewed um, studies. Uh, the diagrams on this slide show um, the sort of progression that's happening um, and the effects of climate change on the environment. Sea levels are rising and the surface area of Arctic sea ice is decreasing. And as I mentioned just now, these temperature increases strongly correspond to model increases. And the IPCC reports state with high confidence that temperatures are increasing. And importantly, they also identify that carbon dioxide is primarily responsible for this. Uh, the radiative forcing of carbon dioxide is 1.82 out of a total of 2.29. So that's uh, an illustration of how much carbon dioxide is contributing to climate change and the changing global temperatures. Uh, some of the research that we looked into when thinking about the environmental and economic costs of climate change um, include looking at the social cost of carbon on which uh, some of our, pol our policy instruments are is based on and one important um, study we looked at is the U.S. Interagency Workgroup on the Social Cost of Carbon, which estimated um, that the social cost of carbon is $33, and this is based on a 3% discount rate and for 2010. And um, the slide shows some of the models that were used to derive these numbers. And these numbers are uh, similar to um, a large body of research on the cost of carbon um, for illustration. Um, it's a bit lower than current costs to sequester carbon dioxide from coal plants. And um, this next slide shows some of the impacts and the nature of the impacts uh, expected due to climate change. And these impacts are expected to vary uh, by region, and there will be a very uneven distribution of these impacts, and they're likely to strain public sector budgets significantly. And this next slide shows some of, um, some examples of climate change impacts, including its impacts on water supply and agriculture and coastal impacts, which have already um, cost uh, the U.S. significant amounts of money to mitigate and to, um, to mitigate these impacts. The approach that we took to the market failures um, namely negative environmental externalities and overconsumption of public goods um, such as air include a combination of price and quantity approaches and we feel that this will yield the most efficient outcome. Taxation, both 
uh, taxation and permit standards have uh, their merits, and that's why we have chosen to use them in combination. And this, um, this new legislation is planned for both new and existing industries, unlike some um, previously proposed legislation which only covers new industries. So the first thing we looked at is taxation, which we uh, expect to be revenue neutral. Firstly, we propose to reduce fossil fuel subsidies, which is on the order of $30 billion. And this will allow the prices of uh, fossil fuels to accurately reflect the cost of extraction and to some extent its impacts on the environment. We also propose to increase the gas excise tax at the federal level which has not increased in many years due to it not being pegged to inflation. And we feel that increasing the gas tax is a lot more effective than increasing the CFE standards that the Obama administration has attempted to use to increase fleet fuel efficiency. For example, in Canada, the gas price is 38% higher and the fuel consumption is 31% lower. And we do feel we can, uh, this will induce substitution effects such as uh, switching to public transport or carpooling. And just some numbers, increasing a, the gas tax from 18 cents to 30 cents would, is predicted to result in 12% lower consumption. And this is shown to be cheaper than uh, existing policy proposals. Additionally, we propose to implement a carbon tax, which is, uh, for the most part, based on the social co cost of carbon we identified just now. And this will apply to direct emissions from large emitters, and it's effective for industries that aren't covered under permit trading. Um, the carbon tax has been implemented successfully in several countries, such as Australia and Norway. For example, in Australia, it resulted in a 9% decrease in carbon emissions within six months, and that was a 10-year low. Uh, carbon taxation also allows for more cost certainty than cap and trade, because it is clear what um, the cost will be to firms. Uh, Andrew and I also believe that a cap-and-trade program should be implemented in the United States. But before such a program is implemented, I think the United States government needs to look at um, some of the failures of previous cap-and-trade cap and programs and the successes of previous cap-and-trade programs. Um, namely, uh, the United States needs to look to the EU's emission trading system. Um, that, on April 16th of 2013, uh, was um, voted um, down and uh, further attempts to bolster Europe's flagship program um, have been rejected. Um, this, this is because carbon prices have plunged to such low levels because of massive overcapacity uh, in the carbon market. Um, in other words, uh, the EU failed to put strict limits on carbon permits um, given out and uh, way too many were given out and therefore uh, prices have fallen from 20 euros a ton in 2011 to uh, 5 euros a ton in early 2013. Um, the United States also needs to look at California's system, which, unlike the ETS, um, has limited the amount of allowances um, given out. Um, and uh, we also believe that uh, there needs to be this hybrid approach of an initial allocation by the government of 50% um, carbon permits into the carbon market, um, but then over time, this needs to be phased down to uh, zero um, because we believe that a purely free market approach um, to a cap and trade program um, is important. Um, and this, we also should look at uh, the successes of the regional greenhouse gas initiative in some of the northeastern states um, that has been very successful um, because of a commitment to strict uh, carbon permit um, allowances. Um, and also uh, a, a really strong attempt to uh, keep the carbon price at a, um, a stable level. Uh, also, we believe that a safety valve um, that puts an upper bound on the costs that firms will incur to meet emission caps um, by offering the option of purchasing additional allowances of predetermined fee needs to be implemented. Um, I think this um, effective price ceiling in the emission allowance market really will reflect Andrew and I's a hybrid approach to climate policy. Uh, for example, if a company has no other option than to emit more greenhouse gases, the government can set a price ceiling on how um, 
how much it will cost in an auction, um, and this, this provides some price limitation for companies that are forced to emit um, more greenhouse gases. Um, also, uh, Andrew and I want to talk about um, some of the uh, potential, um, where some of the potential revenue from, from our proposed taxes will be going. Um, specifically, uh, we need to consider that uh, a carbon tax is going to hit the, the lowest, the lowest and lower income individuals the most because their energy bills are going to be arising um, because of higher prices. Um, and we think that cash transfers, tax credits, and energy subsidies to these low-income individuals um, can help combat uh, the, this, this issue. We also think that um, the revenue needs to be directed towards um, further job training for workers who, have made, who may have been laid off in the initial months after um, such a carbon tax and um, some more costs that uh, firms have incurred. Uh, lastly, we think that uh, these revenues need to be directed towards more innovation um, and more support for low carbon technologies. Um, for example, renew renewable energies are something that we think America should, should support um, financially. Um, and that's, I think, where uh, some of our, uh, some of the revenue from our um, tax can go. Also, um, we think that uh, the, the revenue from such a carbon tax um, can go towards um, a reduction in the corporate the corporate um, income tax. For example, reducing the payroll tax by two percentage points in 2012 could be financed with an economy-wide carbon tax on the order of 15 to 20 dollars per ton of CO2. In short, we want to emphasize the fact that a carbon tax could bring in on the order of 100 to 300 billion dollars um, that could go towards um, fixing some of the negative effects of such a cost, uh, such a tax, and also towards um, supporting further uh, research and innovation in other um, uh, renewable energies and energy efficient um, technologies. And building upon that, well, we also looked at some of the primary and secondary effects of such policies on the economy. And it's expected that domestic greenhouse gas mitigation uh, policies will be significant, uh, will have a significant cost, and this is on the order of 1 to 2 percent of national income. And that's expected to have far-reaching effects on the economy, on cost of living, and on labor supply. But we believe that the policies, the programs we have proposed previously will help to mitigate th this effects in the short term. And in the medium to long term, um, for most industries, there will be a rebound that will be virtually complete. Uh, some of the industries that will continue to bear the effects and which will be affected include the petroleum refining and the metal fabrication industries. Uh, in terms of the consumer price index, index uh, increases could be um, approximately 0.7 to 1%. And uh, we obtained these numbers based on Australia's experience uh, in implementing some carbon taxation. Um, we also do expect that uh, overseas emissions will increase slightly and this will offset the reductions in uh, US emissions. This is because some industries will have to shift overseas and this is expected to be approximately 25% of the reduction in US emissions. On the whole, we do think that in the medium to long term uh, there won't be significant effects and um, our policies will also um, mitigate some national security issues because of the reduced reliance on foreign sources of fossil fuels. Uh, my partner Andrew and I uh, also think it's really important to consider how realistic it is that some of these policies and programs uh, will actually be implemented in the United States. Um, the United States um, is very accustomed to cheap fossil fuel energy. And as with uh, most legislation, uh, le legislation uh, change, um, it's really hard um, to really change how America views uh, climate change and climate change policy. Um, America, as Barack Obama in his State of the Union address, um, needs to get its act together uh, in, in, in climate change policy. Um, First of all, uh, the United States needs to be less um, affected by interest groups and lobbyists, um, specifically uh, 
those who affect um, congressional campaign outcomes um, based off of whether or not they support fossil fuel subsidies or reject um, you know, further support for renewable energies or um, just reject any of the policies or programs that, that Andrew and I have put forward. Um, climate change uh, is really, is essentially unobservable um, a thing. We, we see the weather, but we don't, we don't see climate. Um, and it's important to consider that it could take a, cat a catastrophe for an American public opinion to really turn around and wake up to how important it is uh, for some of these policies and programs to be put in place to combat further global warming. Um, if, if America is committed to securing the same type of prosperity today for later generations, it really needs to act and put forth some of the uh, policies and proposals that Andrew and I have put forth. Uh, it needs to be, um, it needs to stop being uh, the, the, con the country um, that has the most people who reject uh, climate change, and it needs to start being reasonable about uh, the long-term effects of putting off such uh, programs and policies. Um, thank you for watching our uh, presentation, and I hope you consider our uh, economics of climate change policy um, presentation.